What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Friday, the fifth and final week of the season of Lent, we conclude our 2020 Lenten devotion, Faith of Our Fathers. We're going to close out with the death and burial of Jesus from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 15. We have a great quote from the Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord and, of course, our ongoing catechesis, I think, the comfort of confession and absolution. One more time. Stick around. So, for this series, we end at the death and burial of Jesus, but we as Christians know that that is not the end of the story. So I would encourage you uh, on Saturday to continue to read the remainder of the Gospel of Mark, that your hearts may be prepared for Palm Sunday. Grant it may be the most awkward Palm Sunday the church year has seen in a very long time, but Palm Sunday nonetheless. So we pick up Mark chapter 15, beginning at verse 33. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, laba sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last and said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who had also himself who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. There's not a popular theory, but a theory. It's called the swoon theory. That Jesus fainted on the cross. And of course, the cool of the tomb revived him and he was able to walk out somehow miraculously on crucified feet and this is the resurrection but mark here makes it abundantly clear in painstaking detail that jesus cried out in a loud voice and breathed his last that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom that the, the pagan centurion confessed seeing this kind of death. I mean, being a, a centurion of, of the crucifixion guard, he'd seen crucifixion all the time, but seeing the way Jesus died confessed him to be the Son of God. All the witnesses that were there who watched him die, who had been with him through his ministry, and the boldness of Joseph of Arimathea, to claim the body, the granting of Pilate for the claiming of the body, the details of the shroud, and the tomb, and the rock. Jesus truly died, and in the words for the hymn of this day, uh, O Darkest Woe, um, 
if you have your LSB, it's in 448. Verse 2, O sorrow, dread, our God is dead. Upon the cross extended there, his love enlivened us as his life was ended. God died for you. God shed his blood for you. Certainly not God the Father, nor God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, but God nonetheless. If truly just a man died, then we are still in our sin. But God shed his precious blood for you. God cried out, why have you forsaken me? So that even in your darkest day, your darkest woe, the love and the light of God in Christ still shines on you believer and unbeliever alike we will never know you me as christians those redeemed those of us who have been baptized buried with christ into this death and raised to the power of his resurrection by baptism we will never know this we will never understand this never comprehend the suffering of christ as he drank that awful cup that he referenced in the garden the one that he said if it be possible let this cup pass from me but not what i will but you will. This perfect obedience of Christ on the cross, the suffering of the pain and the shame and the wrath sets you free. Jesus truly died in human history, was truly buried. And I encourage you to finish the Gospel of Mark before Palm Sunday to learn that he is truly also risen from the dead. Now, our reading from the solid declaration of the formula of Concord. Faith justifies because it lays hold of and accepts Christ's merit in the promise of the Holy Gospel. The righteousness that is credited to faith or to the believer out of pure grace is Christ's obedience, suffering, and resurrection since he has made satisfaction for us to the law and paid for our sins. Christ is not man alone, but God and man in one undivided person. Therefore, he was hardly subject to the law because he is the Lord of the law, just as he didn't have to suffer and die for his own sake. For this reason, then, his obedience, not only in his suffering and dying, but also because he was voluntarily made under the law in our place and fulfilled the law, by this obedience, is credited to us for righteousness. So because of this complete obedience, which he rendered to his heavenly Father for us by doing and suffering, and in living and dying, God forgives our sins. He regards us as godly and righteous, and he eternally saves us. This righteousness is brought to us by the Holy Spirit through the gospel and in the sacraments. It is applied, taken, and received through faith. Therefore, believers have reconciliation with God, forgiveness of sins, God's grace, sonship, and are heirs of eternal life. Wow. So it was sad and mournful and sorrowful as this text has been what great gospel good news this is for us that god in human flesh has made satisfaction for sin and in baptism our participation into his death and resurrection god adopts us as righteous holy pure redeemed sons and daughters and gives to us eternal life we close out this series of our Lenten devotion on faith of our fathers with an overlooked gift, that of confession and absolution. Absolution, or the power of the keys, is an aid against sin and a consolation for a bad conscience. It is ordained by Christ in the gospel, Matthew sixteen nineteen. Therefore, confession and absolution should by no means be abolished in the church. This is especially for the sake of timid consciences and untrained young people, so they may be examined and instructed in Christian doctrine. But the listing of sins should be free to everyone as to what a person wishes to list or not to list. For as long as we are in the flesh, we will not lie when we say, I am a poor man, full of sin. 
I see in my members another law, and such, Romans 7.23, since private absolution originates in the office of the keys, it should not be despised, but greatly and highly esteemed, along with all other offices of the Christian church. We must, we must constantly maintain this point. God does not want to deal with us in any other way than through the spoken word and the sacraments. Whatever is praised is from the Spirit without the word and sacraments is the devil himself. God wanted to appear even to Moses through the burning bush and spoken word. Exodus 3, 2 through 15. No prophet, neither Elijah nor Elisha, received the Spirit without the Ten Commandments or the spoken word. John the Baptist was not conceived without the word of Gabriel coming first, nor did he leap in his mother's womb without Mary's voice. Luke 1, 11 through 20 and 41. Peter says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter 1, 21. It's important to understand this, this key phrase from the small called articles. We must constantly maintain this point. God does not want to deal with us in any other way than through the spoken word and the sacraments. Whatever is praised as from the Spirit without the word and sacraments is the devil himself. We just got done reading that God, the word made flesh, the word and the physical element, worked for us salvation god through his word and a physical element which is then that same which is given to us in the sacrament of the altar worked and dealt with mankind through word and sacrament god dealt with mankind by his word and it, his promise his word was attached to a physical element to food wasn't it the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and now god deals with us by giving to us the fruit of the cross by word and promise clear so whatever we feel whatever we think the holy spirit might be telling us look we have a simple comfort god does not desire to deal with us except for by his spoken word and his sacraments these are the treasures that Christ left to his church. This is the mission. This is how repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in Jesus' name. The word and the sacraments, and especially confession and absolution, that we, not burdened under the law, but made free by the gospel on account of the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, can go to our pastor and confess our sins. And there is no five Hail Marys, ten Our Fathers, and pay me this much money and 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 do this much penance. No. It's done. Jesus paid the debt in full. So I hope for your sake this Lenten devotion from the treasury of daily prayer through the Gospel of Mark, the writings of church fathers past and relatively present. Our study of the Lutheran Confessions has been helpful for you. This is it. This is the end of, of the series uh, for Lent. I can relax <laughs> a little bit. I can go back to two videos a week and hopefully quality will go, all well, three videos a week now, and quality will go up. But I'm looking forward to seeing you as I always have with my regular episodes. We've still got the story of our faith. We've still got Liturgy 101, Lutheran Lemonade, and whatever else pop culture things might pop up. It has been a joy to read the Gospel of Mark with you and to read the writings of ancient Christians and to study the Lutheran Confessions with you. So, as we've ended everyone, we end in prayer. Merciful and everlasting God, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all to bear our sin on the cross. 
Grant that our hearts may be so fixed with steadfast faith in him that we fear not the power of sin, death, and the devil. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.